this video is going to extend the Darcy law to multi-phase flow and porous media. So let's just write down the empirical form of the multi-phase Darcy equation. So just like Darcy's law for single phase flow, there's going to be a Darcy velocity or flux, but because it's multi-phase flow, we need to reference the phase that we're looking at. So P will be the phase. So P is the phase. I'm going to have three phases, potentially one, two, three. Those are in order of density. One is the densest phase, then two, then three. If we're thinking about various applications, by default, one is normally the aqueous or water, two would be oil or gas, and three would be a gaseous phase. Okay, so that's what we're referring to, the flow of a fluid phase through a porous medium. Okay, then we write something that looks just like the Darcy law. So we've got a minus the permeability. We've got the viscosity, and again, I need to label it as the uh, appropriate phase. And then this is a vector. I have a pressure gradient again in that phase minus the density of the phase we want. Sorry, that's supposed to be a P. Let's do that properly. That's the density of phase P. G is a vector. Okay, so this is a vector equation. Okay, Q is directed in the gradient of the pressure of the relevant phase. But I left a gap here because there's one additional term that I need to introduce. And this is what's called the relative permeability. And I give it the same symbol as absolute permeability, the permeability we've met before for single phase flow, um, but I give it a small k, lowercase k. So kr is the new thing that we've introduced and that's the relative permeability. It is dimensionless, right? Because I don't, haven't in, introduced any other dimensional quantities. So it's a dimensionless th quantity. So let's explain this carefully. The conceptual picture of multi-phase flow and pause media is very much along the lines of what I've introduced in the previous videos. I've assumed that you have a position of capillary equilibrium at any one moment. So you have a capillary pressure, you have a configuration of fluids within the pore space. We've talked about that. We talked about when you change the capillary pressure, how the configurations change due to displacement. But just imagine you sort of freeze frame everything at one moment. Then what we have is we have one or sorry, two or three phases present within the pore space. And those phases are moving very slowly. Most subsurface applications, as I said, we're only moving a few centimetres a day. So with this slow flow, what K times KR measure is essentially the flow conductance of a phase. So how readily that fixed configuration of fluid flows through the porous medium. Now, of course, because there's more than one phase present within the pore space, if we take one of the phases, say phase one, water, right? the water is connected in the regions of the pore space that it fills, maybe there's been some snap off and some pore filling, so it's in the centres of some of the pores and throats, but it's also flowing through layers. So you can imagine that its flow potential, its flow conductance, is considerably lower than it would be if we had an equivalent porous media completely saturated with water. So KR, measures essentially the amount by which the flow conductance is restricted due to the presence of the other phase. So it's going to be something that whose value should be between zero and one. It's zero if a phase is trapped. We talked about trapping the non-wetting phase in the pore space. So when that phase is trapped, the relative permeability is zero. Okay. If we completely saturate with one phase by definition, the relative permeability is one. So the relative permeability varies between uh, one and zero, but it's also going to be a function clearly of saturation. Okay, so conventionally we would write this certainly for two phase flow. So we have 
two phases one and two, that this would be a function, just as I do with capillary pressure, of the saturation of phase one. Okay, so that's how, how we're going to write it. So we write the relative permeability as a function of the water saturation. Now, there are some assumptions here. Conceptually, we are thinking about fixed flow pathways. We're assuming that at the pore scale, we're in capillary equilibrium. Mathematically, this is a complete description now of multiphase flow with the additional function. So we've got the function KRP of S, and we also have a capillary pressure, which we can also write certainly for two phase flow as a function two saturation, which is the pressure in phase two minus the pressure in phase one. Because you notice here, this is a pressure gradient in a given phase. We can then write everything in terms of just one pressure using uh, the capillary pressure. And we have this defined as a function of saturation. So for those of you who've seen my other videos, we can actually develop this mathematically. We can solve a conservation equation. We can make quantitative statements about fluid flow, essentially knowing this function and this function. Are the assumptions correct? In most cases, yes. There are cases where the flow becomes faster and we begin to see dynamic effects. Empirically, we still use this type of law. We say there is a flux and it is related to some sort of gradient, but then the relative permeability can be a function then of other things such as the flow rate. But let's pause that. Let's actually talk about what these relative permeability functions look like. So I'm going to look at the relative permeability for water flooding. So we're going to assume that a non-wetting phase has entered the pore space of a porous medium, and now the wetting phase is going to displace the non-wetting phase. So this is going to be um, a water wet system or a hydrophilic system or something that is wetting to phase one, and that phase one will be displacing phase two. So phase one displaces phase two. This is an imbibition displacement, so I'm going to assume that it's water wet. Okay, so what, what would the relative permeabilities look like? So this is the relative permeability on this axis, as I said, theoretically it can have a value that can vary between 0 and 1. On this axis, as I said, traditionally we write the relative permeability as a function of S1, this is zero, this is one. Now let's consider the relative permeability of indeed phase one, okay? The specific case we're looking at is an imbibition process, a secondary imbibition process. So we've initially, we've had primary drainage, we've injected the non-wetting phase till we've reached an initial low saturation, which we call S1i. At that point, we can assume that the water either is confined in very thin layers, so barely flows, or indeed the water is literally trapped. In which case, to a good approximation, uh, the relative permeability is pretty much zero. Now let's think about the nature of the displacement, and I'm going to illustrate that a little bit more um, later. But we've already shown in previous videos that this is a percolation type displacement. We have snap off in the narrowest regions of the pore space, while the wetting layers begin to swell, and there's a little bit of pore filling. But because you're preferentially filling the narrowest regions of the pore space, and furthermore, those regions you fill are not necessarily connected until you reach the percolation threshold, I think it doesn't require a great deal of imagination to see that the relative permeability is going to retain, and actually really well, the low value, even as the saturation increases. We do know eventually, we don't get to a saturation of one because the non-wetting phase is trapped within the larger pore spaces. So we've already met this before. This is one minus the residual saturation of phase two. So this is the residual saturation. And we also know typical values. Okay, exactly the same as when we looked at um, capillary pressure, we'd expect the residual saturation to be somewhere between 50 and 20%, somewhere between 0.5 and 0.2. So we know that this relative permeability function is going to end somewhere, is going to end at this saturation. Let's uh, get that a bit more accurately done. Okay, so it's going to end at this saturation. We're not going to go any further than this 
because the non-witty phase is trapped. So what does the function look like? As I said, it's empirical. What I mean by that is something you measure. Okay, You can use all the different uh, physics that I've described, actually have a model of the pore space and predict these relative permeabilities. And indeed, under these constraints, you can predict relative permeability, certainly for simple porous media, if you know the wettability and you know that it's water wet, really quite successfully. So there is no, there's no particular huge ambiguity here. So the relative permeability looks like this. It stays really very low. It does begin to increase. But even when we get to the highest saturation, all right, this may be 70% or something like that. You might say, well, 70% saturation of water, you'd expect the relative permeability, you know, to be close to one. No, because remember, the water is still confined in the narrowest regions. Where is the other, the non-wetting phase, the oil or the gas? Where is that trapped? It's trapped in the big pores. And that really restricts the flow. And again, the good analogy is with traffic. And when you've got traffic in the city, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all the big junctions, right? All the big places where there are lots of roads coming in. Those are the pores. I'm going to block those. How easy is it to drive across the city now? Virtually impossible, isn't it? All the big, easy places have been blocked off. So that's exactly what you see in you know, this three-dimensional flow in porous media. Um, the relative permeability for the water, even at the, quote, end point, is really quite low. You also see, you don't see something that's a linear function, it's highly non-linear, because to begin with, it stays very low. And again, because of the percolation process, okay, you will reach the percolation threshold at some point, but you're still confined to the narrow region. So not, nothing dramatic is happening here. So let's label this point. We can call that KR1 max is typically less than about 0.2. So 0.2 is normally the maximum value. Typically, it won't be less than about 5%, right? something like that. Right? So normally, expecting somewhere here, the way I've drawn it, it does look quite high because I wanted to you obviously have some room on the graph. But normally, you're expecting the maximum wetting phase relative permeability to here, here to be in the range of about 20%, about 5%. Okay. Now, let's look at the other phase, um, the... Phase two. Now, phase two, if you think about it, at the initial saturation, the non-wetting phase has invaded virtually all of the pore space. And the wetting phase is just in a few narrow elements or in layers. So even if the saturation here is you know 20% or so, the non-wetting phase is really well connected because it's connected through all the bigger pores. So you'd expect the maximum value here KR2 max, where we start, is normally greater than about 80% or more. There are some exceptions, but generally speaking, in a good experiment where you've driven the saturation down to a, a low value here after primary drainage, uh, this relative permeability is, is either indistinguishable from one or certainly very close to one. Okay, so what does the relative permeability look like? It's almost a straight line. It doesn't have to be a straight line. I've drawn it like this just for simplicity, but it is quite a quite a sharp decrease here. Um, the water flood process is going in this direction in saturation space. So as I inject water phase one, the relative permeability of the defending phase, the phase that's being displaced, is clearly going down. So this is going down and water's going up. Okay. Why does it fall reasonably rapidly and certainly rapidly near the end point? It's because although the water's filling the narrow regions, it's beginning to block off some flow pathways. And you certainly see this near the end where the non-wetting phase is getting trapped in the pore space and the water is snapping off in a few places and breaking the remaining flow paths. So again, using the traffic analogy, so imagine you start blocking the narrowest roads to begin with. That doesn't make a big difference to the traffic Okay, it makes it a bit more awkward, but near, you know, just as there's a connected path across the city, you block a critical road, even if it's quite a narrow street. That's that. That's where all the traffic has to go, and suddenly um, there's no flow at all. Okay, so we see an almost linear decrease, and the important thing here is there's a relatively sharp drop here as you disconnect um, the final final flow paths for the uh, non-wetting phase. Now. The way I've done it, I've shown in blue 
you know, the water relative permeability, right? Blue for water. Uh, the non-wetting phase can be an oil or gas in a different colour. Um, normally, you don't. It's a bit amateurish to ha actually have to label these. I think you should be able to see this. This one starts at zero and goes up. This one starts near one and goes down. It should be self-evident which relative permeability is which. Okay. So this is, um, as I said, the imbibition relative permeability. Um, so this will be a water wet rock. Uh, the physics of the process is that it's percolation, ordinary percolation. The final statement is what does that mean in terms of macroscopic displacement? Now I referred to previously that with these equations and known, by which I mean measured functions, capillary pressure and relative permeability, you're able to solve these equations either numerically in three dimensions or analytically in one dimension. And I have a series of videos that shows how to do this. And then you can say, for instance, if I inject water, how much oil or how much gas will I displace? You can do this properly, rigorously. OK, I'm now going to show you a sort of simple hand waving method, but don't get confused and think that somehow contradicts some rigorous mathematics. No, there's the rigorous mathematics that is what it is. OK, this is just, you know, wave a hand and get an idea of what's going on. So with a water wet medium, what you see macroscopically is when water moves into the pore space, it fills these narrow regions and is held back. That is, it doesn't flow very readily. The non-wetting phase, particularly if it's a gas, can flow readily. Right? It's got a lower viscosity and it goes through the larger pores. So what you see is you see a displacement that goes from the initial saturation here to something that's either at the residual or close. And the way of sort of, as I said, hand waving, it depends exactly on the viscosities of the fluids and the full function, so don't over-interpret it. But roughly speaking, when you inject the water, you'll see the saturation relatively rapidly move from this initial value to somewhere close to where the relative permeabilities cross. Because when they cross beyond here, you have more water flow than you do of the non-wetting phase. So you've got more water flow than gas flow, assuming similar viscosities, which isn't terribly good. So maybe more water flow than oil flow. When you're this way around, the non-wetting phase is flowing much more readily than the water. So that's basically moving out of the way. So just as a general rule, which we're going to use later, you tend to see movement from about this saturation to around where the relative permeabilities cross, which, because of the nature of these relative permeability functions for a water wet medium, is very close to the residual saturation. In the next video, we're going to extend this and we're going to look at typical relative permeability functions. And again, this hand waving assessment of recovery um, for mixed wet media and media that are hydrophobic or oil wet or indeed even gas wetting. Thank you very much.